right. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. We're pleased to bring you this month's installment of the E4C seminar series, which aims to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. Uh, as many of you are aware, we host a new research institution monthly to learn about their work advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and beyond. Today's seminar is presented with Dr. Natasha Wright, who is the Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Minnesota. My name is Jana Aranda, and I am the President of Engineering for Change, and I'll be one of the moderators for today's seminar along with my wonderful colleague and collaborator, Dr. Jesse Austin Brennerman, who is the Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Michigan, where he, uh, he earned his PhD in Mechanical Engineering from MIT and also holds an SM in Mechanical Engineering and a BS in Ocean Engineering from MIT. So thank you, Jesse. All right. Uh, the seminar you're participating in today will be archived on E4C site and our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide. Information on upcoming seminars is available on our site. Any first year members will receive invitations to upcoming seminars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the Engineering for Change team at research at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C seminar series. And we're also really keen to hear from you more generally about our suggested strategy, our topics for the future. Um, the URL is listed here for our survey, and this will also come up once the webinar, uh, the seminar ends. So do kindly request that you respond and, and share your insights and help us to formulate our plans for future topics and speakers. So before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than a million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member the first membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding, calls, fellowships, and more. The first members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interests. We invite you to visit our website to learn more and sign up. E4C's research work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by Engineering for Change research fellows annually on behalf of our partners and sponsors and delivered as digestible reports with implementable insights. We invite you to visit our research page, the URL is listed on this slide, to explore our field insights, research collaborations, and review the state of engineering for global development a compilation of the academic programs and institutions offering training in this sector. If you have research questions or want to work with us on a project as a research fellow, please contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org. And on a note of events, I am really excited to invite you all to join us at our upcoming event, um, Impact Engineered. This is a, will be a virtual event so taking place on December 3rd and 4th, uh, where you can connect with leading social innovators across the engineering and technology sectors who are solving urgent global challenges. Our programming will focus on ecosystems for social impact, uh, improving lives and livelihoods through enterprise, and the role of engineering associations and academic institutions in driving sustainable development. Registration is free. Uh, we're so excited to be able to deliver this uh, to our broad audience this year. Typically, we host it in New York City, but now we'll be online, and we hope that all of you will join us. Uh, please register at impact-engineer.org. Impact the URL is listed here. So, 
With that, I think uh, it's time to move on to some important housekeeping items before we start. We'd like to make sure that uh, typically we used to say uh, practice using Zoom, but I think in this instance, uh, we have all had lots of practice using Zoom. Um, but I would like to invite you all to uh, type in your location into our chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen. So just let us know where you're joining us from today. All right, we have, I'm, I'm in Brooklyn, so I'm just gonna type that in as well. So we have folks from uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Missouri, Utah, um, Alberta, Canada, San Diego, uh, Spain, um, more Michigan and Maine, South Carolina I'm seeing here, India, um, several from India, New Brunswick. Oh, welcome New Brunswick. I'm, I'm originally from Toronto. It's exciting to see you guys here. First time having, I think in my experience, I'm a reply from New Brunswick. Welcome. Uh, and believe it or not, I've been to Darwad, India. So welcome. Uh, see folks from Toronto and Florida, Egypt and Germany. We're so excited to have you here. Please uh, do share where you're from. Um, the chat window can be used for uh, any remarks you might have during the seminar. And if you have technical questions, uh, you can also feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin. If you're listening to our broadcast and you have any troubles, try try opening up in a different uh, browser as well. That might help. Um, all right. And during our seminar, if you have any questions, please kindly do type those questions into our, our Q&A box. Um, which is, is really important because we do aggregate those questions and anything that's not answered, we will have our speaker uh, address those and potentially publish them on our platform afterwards. So uh, it's really important for us that you do um, put your questions into the Q&A and also helps us to keep all those questions organized. So welcome everyone from all over the world. It is now my deep pleasure to introduce to you our, our speaker, Dr. Natasha Wright. As I mentioned, she is at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Her research and teaching interests include membrane-based separation processes, desalination, photovoltaic and solar thermal water treatment, design ethnography, and the role of engineering in global development. She completed her PhD in the Global Engineering and Research Lab at MIT in 2018 and developed the semester course Engineering and Development at Tufts University. She was awarded the Lemelson MIT Award for Graduate Inventors, was listed on the Forbes 30 Under 30 energy, in Energy list, and led the team that won the USAID D-Cell Prize in 2015. Natasha received her BSME from the University of St. Thomas, St. Paul, Minnesota. Natasha, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, turn it over to you, and, and again, a warm welcome. Unmute here. And one second here. There you go. It's coming up. <laughs> okay. We had this working. There we go. Are you seeing my slide there for me? Yep. Looks good. Awesome. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction, Yana. Um, I don't know that I need to add a whole lot to that introduction. I would say that um, while most of the work or all of the work that is in present tense that I'll be presenting today is done at the University of Minnesota, um, much of the desalination work that I'll be presenting was done at when I was a member of the Global Engineering and Research Lab at MIT. That's the GEAR lab and the PI for that lab is Amos Winter. And so I just used the word desalination system. And as I've watched some of the previous seminars as part of the series, I've noticed that this idea of systems thinking has been really prevalent. And when we think about a desalination system, that can mean a lot of different things. So first of all, in this photo, the desalination part, the part that's actually removing salt from water, is actually inside this trailer. And so in some ways, that in and of itself is the desalination system. However, usually when I reference that, I'm referring not, not just to the, the uh, membrane separation process, processes or the process that's removing the salt, I'm actually also referring to the energy system in the water energy nexus, as we like to call it. And I may also be referring, or maybe I should be referring, to where the water is coming from, where the wastewater is going, and where the clean water or safe drinking water is being uh, uh, 
uh, transferred to people who need it. And so in this case, when I think about these aspects of a desalination system, I like to think about the boundaries of that system. And I think as an engineer, but not as a systems designer or a, or a systems engineer per se, I still need to think about the system and what the boundaries of it are. And that's going to be a big theme throughout my talk. Specifically, I'm going to think about the boundaries of my system. I'm going to think about what stake stakeholders need to be considered within the boundaries of that system. And I'm going to think about how much I, as a mechanical engineer, in, in my case, need to know about the system in order to have a positive impact or hopefully have a positive impact. And so to do that, I'm going to be working uh, with sort of the following process. So on the left here, we have where I often start projects, which is that I have identified an impact area that I'm excited about, I'm interested in, and that it has a skill set that might be relevant to my training. And that's different for everyone that's joining us here on the call today, that skill set that you have and why you think you're interested. I'm then going to work on defining the system. And when I do that the first time, I'm going to do that a bunch of times, that's why there's a back arrow. I'm going to do that with one or two what I call strategic stakeholders. So that's not all of my stakeholders, and often it's not even the end user of the technology. But it's someone who I've chosen as a strategic stakeholder because they know something about the system as a whole. I'm then going to work on identifying where there might be technical challenges, in this case technical challenges because I'm coming from an engineering background, for others of you that might be a policy challenge, for example, and what the key limitations might be. If that still aligns with my skill set, I'm going to continue and I'm going to continue looping back and forth between defining the system and defining the problems with more and more and more stakeholders. As a result, this piece of the process usually takes me six or more months. Additionally, I like to think about this system in terms of when I engage stakeholders. So early on in the process, that very first step, it's, it's me or my group of students that I'm working with thinking about these impact areas. I'm then bringing in again that one to two critical uh, strategic stakeholders. I'm then bringing in a lot of stakeholders. When I go back to concept development, I'm usually working with fewer and then larger again. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we engage these different partners and stakeholders throughout the process. To do that, I'm going to talk about my background in desalination. And when I first started looking at desalination, I actually was interested in water treatment more broadly. And that strategic partner or that strategic stakeholder that our lab group at MIT had identified was a company called Jane Irrigation. They're an irrigation company. They do things with um, primarily with agriculture, but they were interested in understanding household water filtration for biological contaminants. And when they started thinking about that problem, we had some concepts and some ideas of what that system looked like, household water purification. When I then went and expanded my stakeholder network, that meant that I met with a variety of different groups in India. That includes individuals, families, community groups, village governance, NGOs, etc. You can see the list there. And so over the course of about six months, I met with a variety of different groups. And one of those set, uh, categories was community groups. And so here you can see me with one of those community groups in India. Um, and specifically, this was a group of adult women. Uh, and they're showing me a two-part filter here. It's a gravity-fed filter, so water's put in the top and it comes out the bottom. And the big part that came out of this conversation and other conversations with community members or the end user was that they actually often uh, did have access to or knew about household water filtration devices, but weren't using them. And when I started to ask questions about why they weren't using them or, or you know, what, what they did use them for in that case, I started to hear things like, well, my water makes it hard to digest, my water tastes bad, it ruins my cookware, and it tastes salty. Importantly, they, they seem to associate the plastic ones, which uh, would be associated perhaps with higher quality, as still having the same salty taste. Well, there's a reason for that, and that's because all of these filters don't remove salt. And so one question that came about was, well, how many people actually have access to these filters? How many people are treating their water, even though there are this many, literally hundreds of home filter options available? 
And so it turns out that it, according to the uh, 2018 national family health data, that about 70% of the population is rural population in India is not treating their drinking water. Again, even though there actually are a variety of resources available. And my hypothesis was that part of that might be because these home filters don't remove salt and maybe salt's a prevalent issue in India. So next we started looking at, well, how much salt is actually in the water in India and is this, is this really an issue or, or am I misunderstanding what they mean by salty? And so what I found is that around 60% of the land area in India is underlain with groundwater with salt contents above the recommended level of around 500 milligrams per liter. That's everything that's red, yellow, and green on this map. Additionally, uh, that really only matters if people are using groundwater. Uh, that's a common uh, theme, at least when I'm teaching in students, is like, well, why, why do we care that the groundwater is salty if no one's using it? Uh, we know that people are using it. About 60%, again, of the rural population from that same National Family Health Survey show that folks are using their groundwater as a, their primary drinking water source. Another 33% is piped. A portion of that, at least, would also be from a groundwater source. Importantly, uh, in the 2018 Family Health Survey, we started to see, for the very first time, community RO plants having a really small portion of that pie. RO is reverse osmosis, which I'll talk about in a second. It's a desalination technique. So groundwater salinity in India is an issue. I wanna pause for just a second and actually make a call out on this topic of uh, chemical contamination to an annual review um, that was just published by Susan Amros, uh, Katya Chermukamili, and myself in the annual review of environmental and resources, of environment and resources. And what we did is we looked at global groundwater contamination and specifically the co um, the co-prevalence of these various or co-contamination of various water sources. Uh, we looked both at the global population of risk um, as well as the uh, technologies that are used to mitigate these in places around the world. So this is in a preview format right now on their website and I'm going to be coming back to this study a few times throughout. When we have chemical contamination, I'm focusing pr predominantly on TDS or salt contamination, which is these kind of big black square boxes in this map, but we're often interested in this issue of co-contamination with other, uh, other chemicals as well. And when that happens, we often want a technology that's considered kind of um, across the board to get a lot of things out. And one of those is reverse osmosis. And reverse osmosis is a pressure driven process in which you use a pump to apply a pressure to a membrane and get clean water out of the other side. Uh, one of the biggest companies in India that is doing this in rural communities at a smaller, at, for small scale plants is Tata Projects. This is one of their systems that's fairly representative of a number of the systems I've seen of theirs across the country. And the reason I point this system out is because it's actually been quite successful. They've had over 2000 on-grid reverse osmosis plants installed, at least that's the last time I, I checked a few months ago. And importantly, they were able to achieve economic viability with this system or economic sustainability, let's say. And so what that means is that not only were they able to recover the operating cost of the system, but they actually were also able to recover the capital cost of the system. And that's challenging in international development technologies. Um, frequently, maybe you're trying to cover just the operation cost or maybe you're not trying to cover any of it. But the fact that they were able to create a viable business model drew me to them as a potential stakeholder, as a potential partner in this work. The issue that they do have, however, is that a number of their clients, a number of the people that they were trying to work with, wanted a system that they could use in their community, which was either off-grid or had intermittent, intermittent energy supply. And the issue that they had is that when they moved this, this same RO plant off-grid and attached a photovoltaic or a solar power system, that they were no longer economically viable because the capital cost was too high and they could no not longer hit the three-year payback period time period that the money lenders required. And so that's for a few reasons, um, for folks that know something about re reverse osmosis. The biggest reason is that they were recovering, uh, were recovering a low amount of water, in part because they were using low efficiency and low pressure, or lower pressure pumps. And the reason that Tata Projects is using those is because getting high efficiency pumps at a small volume, or at, not small volume as in um, number of plants, but small volume as in small size scale of the plant itself, 
um, is very expensive. So those pumps that are high efficiency, like the ones you read about in academic literature, are a couple thousand dollars just for the pump itself. And so in order for them to get low cost pumps, they were low efficiency pumps. And as a result, these plants were, this reverse osmosis plant was less efficient than some of those ideal numbers you see in the literature. So we're thinking about this problem. There's maybe a lot of different ways we could go. We could think about redesigning that pump, a low cost pump. We could think about um, using a different technology. We could think about implementing some sort of energy recovery device to recover the pressure. And those are all different technical challenges now that are in my mind at this point in the project. So I start looking more and I'm gonna go back to the literature and I'm thinking more about that map that I saw with groundwater salinity. And we think about the fact that these areas of groundwater salinity actually overlap quite nicely with two other maps. One is the map of water stress in India, uh, where you tend to have higher groundwater salinity in areas of high water stress. Therefore, you want, likely want to make sure that your recovery of your system is high, which means that the most water I can that I put in as feed water, I get back as clean drinking water. And third, that there's intermittent but on-grid electricity. Uh, the intermittent on-grid electricity could be paired with these high solar resources in a photovoltaic powered system. And so we're maybe looking for a solution that pairs well with solar. Some technologies do that better than others. And so as part of this process, I started looking at a technique called electrodialysis. And I'm not going to get into any equations or details, but for those of you that are on the call because you're interested in desalination, I wanted to provide a little bit about how that works. So electrodialysis, um, is a process in which you flow water, salty water, through an anode and a cathode. And so the cathode here is on the left and it's negatively charged. And then I've shown a bunch of positive and negative anions and cations on the screen here as well. You can think of a cation like sodium in your table salt at home. You can think of an anion like chloride in that table salt at home. And so my cation being positively charged is going to be attracted towards my cathode, positive to negative, and my anion towards my anode. And if I just did this, all of my charge would get stuck to those electrodes. And that's actually its own desalination process, which we can get into at a later time if you'd like. In electrodialysis, instead, we introduce a series of membranes called cation and anion exchange membranes. And what makes them special is that they only allow one of the two types of charge to pass. So for example, my cation is going to be attracted towards my cathode, and it's allowed to go that way because it's going through a cation exchange membrane. But when it gets to this anion exchange membrane, it's gonna be blocked because it can't go through one that only passes anions. And so if you look carefully at what that means on your positives and negatives in all sides is that I'm going to end up clearing out certain channels. I'm gonna dilute it of salt. And when I dilute it of salt, I create what's called my diluent. And when I concentrate my salt in the other channels, I'm gonna create my concentrate. Okay. So that's a little bit of introduction to what electrodialysis is, which is the technology that we ended up working on. I want to say that I didn't invent this technology. This has been around since the 1950s. So the question then is, you know, as engineers, as academics, what did we do that wasn't just installing this technology? And there's a number of different things we did um, as a group that I'm going to highlight just briefly. So in most of these systems, I showed those membranes and those membranes in the picture on the right, for example, which is a stack from Ion Tech, are usually kind of squished between these two or sandwiched between these two big electrodes, which are the metal plates on the end. And you can see that that membrane is pretty long. These Ion Tech membranes are about two meters, one and a half to two meters long. And so as a result, my water, as it flows down this membrane, is getting less and less salty. If I look at that kind of in color terms, that means that my diluit as I go from dark blue to light blue is getting less salty and my concentrate is getting more salty because I'm putting the salt from here into here. Okay, now the issue and in, in the, in the, most of the innovations that came out of our lab at MIT regarding this particular technology was recognizing that this means that I can apply more current at the top of my stack than I can at the bottom. And as a result, I'm currently wasting a lot of the capacity that my membrane has. And so a few of the different ways that we approach this, just as an example, is first that we looked at voltage control in batch and continuous systems. And so if I can control the voltage I'm applying at every instant in time, in order to match the voltage I should be applying, I can adequately use all of my membrane area and I can reduce the amount of area I need and therefore the cost. 
As part of my, that was work done by uh, Sahil Shah in the Gear Lab. As part of my own work, I looked at spiral wound modules, which allowed me to have an inner and an outer electrode. And because of the way that the geometry worked, I was applying the right current at the right time. And then we're also looking, and they are continuing to look a lot, at the coupling of photovoltaic systems with desalination systems, so as not to waste this peak of solar energy in the middle of the day, but rather to use that energy to apply voltage and flow rate when it's needed. So with these types of innovations, we have been pushing to pilot technologies in a variety of different places around the world. The first one, as was mentioned in the introduction, was the USA Desal Prize, which took place in New Mexico. Again, this was done with my partner, Jane Irrigation Systems. And as part of that prize, we were evaluated on product water quality, production rate, recovery of these systems. This system was messy. If you look in the photo in the bottom, there's tubes going everywhere, there's probably tripping hazards, <laughs> there's batteries that aren't really covered in a way that would be maybe safe for a minimally trained operator to operate. So this is the first pilot that we built. We then went on to do two different systems, one in Jalgao and one in Shaluru, India, um, that were focused on understanding uh, operation maintenance and performance. And so, for example, the one on the left was completely automated, whereas the one on the right was completely manual in which the operator had to physically change the flow valves during certain parts of the day. So we use these pilots to learn, uh, to answer questions about that. Where is this project now? Well, as I mentioned, um, because of Tata Project's role in doing rural desalination work, there was interest in continuing to work with them to develop this technology. And so Tata Projects um, is still currently looking to commercialize this technology. The first way that they're hoping to do that is actually in these facilities that they call TQ malls, which are at gas stations around the country. On the left-hand side there, you can, those are water spigots where folks can come up and fill um, a water container. And then the system that goes in there, the, the latest sort of pilot system that we developed in India is shown here on the left, and it fits actually uh, the other direction sideways right in the end of that TQ mall. That's what that footprint is for. And so that's kind of where we're at right at the moment with uh, that project as a whole. Now I mentioned, however, this is now when I transitioned out of MIT. I'm still working with GearLab on some of these ideas and topics, but when I've transitioned from MIT to the University of Minnesota, I went back and I thought about, again, the system. So I had been thinking about during that time period, the desalination part, which is in the trailer, and the energy part, which is outside the solar power. But we started to think about what happens if I change the boundaries of my system to also think about where the water's coming from, how the safe water is conveyed to the consumer, and where the brine goes. This became particularly interesting when I started at the University of Minnesota and was uh, in a conversation with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. The MPCA is interested in desalination in Minnesota, even though we're like land of the 10,000 fresh lakes, because we also put a lot of chloride in our water because we have winters and we put salt on the road. And because we put a lot of sul sulfate in the water, which hurts our wild rice crop, which is a very Minnesota specific <laughs> crop. As a result, salty water has become a, a very big issue in Minnesota so much that the MPCA actually commissioned a report to see if it would be economically feasible to desalinate in Minnesota. So it's not just a California, Florida, Texas problem anymore. But what they found is that while it is technologically possible, as we all know, to desalinate, it involves extreme, what they call extreme technologies like reverse osmosis, as well as evaporation and crystallization of the brine. And the reason the report highlighted that so much is because they found that on average, the brine treatment would actually be 63% of the capital cost and 91% of the O&M. That's huge. And so when I saw those numbers backing up the fact that we didn't know what to do with the brine in India either, this idea that, you know, a small change in energy consumption of the desalination system itself is much, it has a lesser effect than if I can create an energy reduction in the brine management. So that's how we transitioned, kind of broadening the system boundaries to start thinking about that piece of the puzzle. So I'd like to highlight again that where we draw the system boundaries not only is key for our understanding of the technical, economic, and political barriers. In this case, I expanded the boundary and I was like, hey, Brian might actually be a bigger issue here. Um, and second, because it also affects how we compare potential technologies. And so this is where I'm going to go back to that review paper that I mentioned. 
So again, we looked at contaminants all around the world and we looked at efficacious piloted technologies. So these are piloted technologies in an international development context. Now you're gonna look at this graph and there's a lot of dots that relate to different contaminants and the treatment approaches. And you're going to, you might be saying, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to get out of these graphs. And the, the, that's kind of the point of these graphs, that there, there isn't a trend, really, in that we might think, hey, if there's a lot more arsenic in the water, it's more expensive to treat. Or maybe people will report that if the system's a lot bigger, it'll be uh, less expensive due to economy of scale. The fact that we don't see those trends either means that that relationship doesn't exist, which to be honest probably isn't true, or at least not fully true. What's more likely is that it means that all of these authors around the world are comparing cost on completely different terms. And so if we think about just those points on the plot related to reverse osmosis treatment of high salinity, then there's uh, the papers that are shown here. And we see that everyone is basing their cost estimate. We look at levelized cost of water, which is dollars per liter, for example using very different metrics. So some people consider the installation cost, some don't. Only three of these papers consider the cost of waste management or dealing with that brine stream I was talking about. Um, only one of them actually considered the energy considered to needed to lift water from the well. Okay. So this is one piece that I'm just putting out there as a, as a research question or food for thought for the community is to say, how do we, how do we avoid this? Because we, this is one of the metrics that we hear about all the time. My, my technology is cheaper. My technology uses less energy. How do we clearly and concisely define the bounds that we used in that system analysis in a way that allows us to actually compare and to understand what to use? Because I think as a practitioner uh, who just knows that their community needs desalination, we're going to look at this graph and maybe we say, oh yeah, we should definitely use Oren system because it's definitely cheaper. Maybe, maybe not, right? And, and I think that's something that we need to think really deeply about. So as I mentioned, uh, this membrane treatment, whether that's electrodialysis, reverse osmosis, or any other desalination <laughs> process, is going to result in a brine stream that's heavily concentrated with salt. And so one of the big things that my research group, and specifically two of my students, uh, Matthew Choza and Mustafa Kadura, have been working on, is where that brine should go and what we should do with it. So one question is, what do we do? So in India right now, to clarify, don't even have a picture because what's happening is it's getting dumped on the ground in, in rural small scale systems. So one question is, what do we do with it here? And in the US, for our systems are typically bigger. This is a system in New Mexico uh, coming out of, a, um, out of a desalination plant where the uh, brine management is happening by thermal evaporation and crystallization. And again, based on those numbers I showed before, the energy to do this is about 20 times more than the energy for the desal itself. Installing a plant like this just by looking at it, even if we made it super tiny, is likely not a viable option in some of the communities that we work in, just because of the complexity of the system, because of the maintenance that's involved with a system like this. Maybe it is. That's what we're looking at. The other option typically is to do something like an evaporation pond. These are evaporation ponds at the Dead Sea, which are pretty famous, which is why I chose that picture. But essentially to dig a hole, to line that hole appropriately such that contaminants don't get into the ground, and then to use that to either collect the salt or whatever it is you're trying to do from your pond. The problem with doing that is that it's not a minimal amount of area, which is hard to see from an aerial shot. So for example, if we replace the plant on the left with land area for an evaporation pond, we would need a lot of area. But it's not just one American football field, it's actually a hundred American football fields to do what that one plant can do. And while that is for a big plant, even if we look at those little tiny desal plants that I showed early on that Tata Projects is making, you would still need one or two football fields of area in order to evaporate the brine that's coming out of that. And that land isn't free, that land is being farmed by folks, that land has all sorts of purposes. So the question is, what do we do instead? And so I'm only gonna give kind of a, a preview of what my group's working on, but as far as going back to that fundamental physics like we talked about, we can think about, well, what's making it take so much land area and what causes, what enhances evaporation? Evaporation is driven, the rate of evaporation is driven by four primary properties, the area, surface area that's available, the air speed flowing over the pond, the temperature of the air and of the fluid, 
and the humidity. We want to increase the top three and uh, decrease the bottom one in order to enhance evaporation. So if you're looking at increasing area only and allowing the other three things to happen naturally, you get a technology that was developed out of Ben Gurion University by Jack Gowron and his team called wind aided intensified evaporation. And this is a very promising technology. They have a company both in India and in the US now looking at um, using the natural power of the wind to evaporate water. The challenge on our end, of course, is that you don't always have the space available, particularly when it's a high humidity area or when you have cooler temperatures. So in our group, we're looking at kind of bird's eye view of what we're trying, the direction we're headed, is how can we uh, couple essentially the wind aided intensified evaporation system with a system that enhances evaporation when it's needed using the other three metrics. So what if we could increase wind speed or increase air speed by introducing a fan only at times of high or low humidity? And what if we could provide control of the incoming brine temperature via use of solar thermal collectors or other systems in order to minimize the amount of area that's needed and therefore the capital cost at any given time? This is sort of the direction we're heading right now with some of the brine evaporation work that we're doing. I'm going to uh, move on to, and hopefully I can cover this last topic quickly so that we still have time for questions, but since it was in the title, I want to talk a little bit about how this is related to dialysis and why that came up. So I was in a mentor meeting just uh, with a, a friend and colleague of mine who's a mentor. She'd worked at the VA for a long time. And we were talking about all sorts of random things when she turned to me and she goes, so electrodialysis, is that, is that anything like dialysis? And I said, dialysis, you mean that thing that's used to treat kidney disease? And she was like, yeah, dialysis, you know, it's pretty expensive. And I said, I don't know, but let me look into it. And so that perked my, perked my interest. And I started looking at what dialysis is and when it's needed. So dialysis is used in two primary cases. One is an end-stage renal disease when the kidneys no longer function and long-term dialysis or a kidney transplant is needed for survival. It also can be used for acute kidney injury when there's a sudden episode of kidney failure. In that case, you're usually on this treatment for less time. In the United States, taxpayers pay about $53.6 billion a year in, in dialysis, $800 million a year for the VA, high mortality rate within a year. However, the case is even more dire in Sub-Saharan Africa, where there's an 88% mortality rate within three months of starting dialysis, primarily due to the cost of treatment. So I started seeing review papers and statistics that looked at this, and, and I became interested. I identified an impact area that I thought I might have a skill set in, and I needed to think more about if my skill set actually mattered. Um, I started to look at how dialysis works. Essentially, in classic hemodialysis, which is the most prevalent form used around the world, uh, blood leaves your body through a catheter that can be placed in a number of different places. That blood then runs through what's called the dialysizer membrane. On one side of the membrane is your blood. On the other side of the membrane is the dialysate fluid. And that fluid has a special combination of salts and sugars that allows for the right amount of diffusion to happen between that fluid and the blood. And so I looked at this and I said, I know stuff about membranes. I know stuff about how to reduce energy consumption in membrane systems. Um, I know how to make that process smaller. Maybe I could make that module smaller. I probably can, kind of looking at some of the physics. And then I said, but before I do any of that, I need to figure out who my partners are and who my primary stakeholders are, right? And so I looked at my first strategic partner to help me guide if this is, is this anything of the right, or am I anywhere close to the right direction? And so I was introduced to two doctors. One is Dr. Imraham McKinney, who's a physician who is visiting our university in our medical device innovation program. He's now a researcher in my lab. Uh, you gotta keep your, keep your partners close when you find good ones. You gotta find a way to keep them around to strengthen the project. And the second is Dr. Bello, who's a nephrologist, one of only a few nephrologists in all of Nigeria. And so what talking to them, and within the first month we realized, is that I needed to expand my system boundary beyond the hemodialysis system to look at other types of dialysis as well, even though they're not prevalent currently in Sub-Saharan Africa and Nigeria specifically. The method that they suggested that I expand the system to is uh, to include peritoneal dialysis. In this system, the dialysate fluid goes into your abdominal cavity 
And because they're fluid, because your membrane in your body itself is a semi-permeable membrane, you actually get those salts and sugars and water going in the direction it's supposed to by the natural membrane in your body. The benefit of this is that you don't need that big machine. You just need the bag of fluid to be put in your body and then to be able to drain that bag of fluid. As a result, it can often be done at home and it's usually less expensive in studies in countries that have both of these technologies available. Okay, so I met with my primary stakeholders. I found out from them I need to think about a bigger system. And so now I'm going to rapidly increase the number of stakeholders that I'm talking to. And I did that, or my team did that over a process of two different field visits, one in November of 2019 and one in January of 2019. Uh, we interviewed a few different groups. The first was that we did a more formal, rigorous design ethnography study. And so we had 33 patients at three hospitals. We actually audio recorded the conversations, transcribed them, and coded them using in vivo software, which is more of an ethnographic um, style of analysis. We did descriptive and emotion-based coding to develop formal themes that came out of that conversation. If you look at just a single person's uh, transcript and do a word cloud, you'll see things come out like time and hours, uh, more so actually than cost. And so when we started doing this more in-depth analysis of the language used, we were able to pull out themes related to cost, but where time was actually a big portion of that cost, which I'll talk about a little more in a second, the importance of the family and how when we described the way that peritoneal dialysis works, um, the feelings of independence as well as apprehension that came with that. Why was time important? Uh, just as a, to ground that a little bit, we found that some people took 10 hours to get to the clinic and it took some hours, some folks seven hours. That's an average of, it was an average of two and a half hours over the course of all of the patients. They then had to do blood work. They had to do a four hour treatment. They did transportation on the way home. That time was for one way. That means that it took between four and 20 plus hours uh, for a single session. You're supposed to do three sessions a week. Most people couldn't afford to do three sessions a week, but that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and it's not just you, it's also a family member because you're required to have a family member in the room for with you when you do this treatment. So if you need two adults going to the hospital three times a week for anywhere between four and a half to 20 plus hours, it's pretty hard to keep a job. And as a result, the financial burden isn't just the cost of the treatment itself, it's the time to do the treatment. So this really is what pushed us not to try to make hemodialysis cheaper, but to say, how can we make peritoneal dialysis and or some other home-based therapy feasible in this context? So transitioning um, to that, we focused again, this is peritoneal dialysis, the one that we're focused on now. In addition to patients, like I said, often the patient isn't even your most critical stakeholder. We also interviewed a variety of other folks, medical doctors, nephrologists, nurses, et cetera. Um, as a result of those conversations, not only did we want to focus on PD or peritoneal dialysis, which is what the patients told us, but we again had to change our system boundary to include the peritoneal dialysis supply chain. And the reason for that is that what, what all of these folks told us is that they have the capabilities to do PD, they don't have the supplies to do it. And when you import peritoneal dialysis fluid, it expires quickly and when it gets stuck at the at customs coming across the border, coming in at port, it expires, so you can't use it. Um, and so it was only viable if we could find a way to make the fluid itself, other parts they could import, the fluid itself available locally. So hemodialysis cost was driven by transportation, nurses, et cetera, whereas peritoneal dialysis, it, we found that locally the cost was driven by access to this fluid. And so currently what we're looking at then is what would it take to generate and or recycle dialysate fluid in decentralized facilities, think hospitals, think people's homes, or even on someone's belt. That's how like an insulin pump it is essentially an artificial pancreas. This would be like an artificial kidney to enable peritoneal dialysis. And right now we think the easiest um, way to enter that uh, conversation is to be looking specifically at how do we generate decentralized PD fluid within the hospital. Going back, I mentioned that we're always rechecking. Now that we've redefined the problem, is this something we should still be answering, our group should still be answering versus just someone else in the world? Um, conveniently, even though we didn't end up uh, looking at the hemodialysis membrane, in order to produce PD fluid, you need water for injection. Water for an injection at the hospital is still desalination and water treatment in a place with intermittent energy. So luckily that's something our group already does. 
Also, the combination, combining salts and sugars with water is actually just the inverse physics of separating water and sugar, salts and sugar with water. And so we feel there's still a role that our group can play in actually developing the system in, in hospitals. And so right now we're kind of where that red line is in the design process. So with that, um, I want to leave you with those same three questions I posed at the beginning. How do we think about the boundaries of your system and how is that defining the technical solutions that you're seeing might need to occur? What stakeholders are needed and are to be considered as part of my system? Do I, who, how many do I need to talk to and with what depth for each stakeholder? And how much do I as an engineer need to know about the system in order to have an impact? How much time should I spend doing that? How, much, how many resources should I put towards doing that? Um, so with that, I'd like to thank my sponsors as well as the rest of the team at the University of Minnesota and at MIT for having this work come together. And I am happy to take questions. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Wright, Natasha. Uh, I, I overlapped with you, obviously, uh, and it was uh, at the Gear Lab and uh, have been enriched uh, just by listening to you talk about your work ever since that point in time. And I'm always hearing new things that are very exciting and inspiring. And certainly this leap into dialysis and thinking about other stakeholders. And uh, I also want to thank you for articulating in an explicit way sort of what your progress for a project is and where you are thinking about that sort of explicitly. I think that we often get into the technical details in engineering and I think that this is uh, just as an important a part of the academic process. How do we determine what questions we're answering or asking and then how do we answer them within the context of applied work which is what we do in engineering. Um, so very exciting to hear that. Uh, I'm glad that we have the seminar series to get a chance to, to talk to you. And we have some questions coming in. A lot of them are, uh, you know, thinking both about the system questions that you asked. Uh, I wanna be clear here in talking with Natasha uh, ahead of this, this seminar. Um, this generally, when we have these seminars, we have sort of questions and, and it's sort of a one way, like we're asking you something, you're giving us your expertise. But I think that Natasha was requesting that you guys do add more. Sorry, this is, my dog does not like the mailman. So unfortunately what happens during COVID, you get to hear his excitement. Um, really wants to have more of a two-way flow of information where you are looking for feedback. You've talked about some of the work you did before, talking about some new work and in moving forward, you want to engage the community, not just in asking you questions, but in helping you get feedback as where should you set the boundary? Like where would people suggest? So uh, I think more than just uh, asking questions for her expertise, if you could add things, if you have suggestions for what she might do. And to start with that, um, uh, I'll, I'll credit Benjamin Crane here, but uh, one, of the, one of the questions was, have you thought about life cycle analyses or any of those other techniques that uh, look more at the, you know, you talked about operations and management, but sort of, the life cycle for your system itself rather than just the water piece of it. Yeah, and even for that life cycle, you have to set the boundary, right, and how far back you go. Um, yes, it's not work that I've typically done myself, but that I've partnered to do. So on the PV-powered electrodialysis, for example, there's a paper on our Gaza system uh, written by uh, Dev, who's a professor now out of Denmark. Um, I believe is where Dev ended up. Um, so that's on the Gaza. I'm happy to share that. If, if you leave it, I can leave the, that paper in the comments that does a life cycle analysis on the PVED stuff. Um, with wastewater treatment stuff in the U.S., uh, for example, starting a new collaboration, working with Jeremy Guest at the University of Illinois, who does full life cycle analysis in that work. So um, when I, I do system optimization and I involve different variables as part of that. Sometimes there's environmental pieces of that. Sometimes it's just energy and cost. Um, but for the nitty gritties of that, I, I tend to partner with folks who have an expertise in it. Yeah, thank you. So, so again, important to have the right people on the team to do the type of work that you want them to do. So I think that's it's a, a really good insight. But also, um, I think, you know, as someone else who also does optimization, I think that it can be difficult to understand when we're drawing these system boundaries, you're just making the system more complex and it's all coupled, it becomes harder to, to find solutions. So I think this is one of the key discussions that we have to have as a community is sort of 
really understanding, you know, we want to have these system models and understand emergent behavior and effects. Um, I want to ask a question related to that. A lot of people are asking sort of, you know, okay, we, you've drawn these boundaries around these systems, you're getting this, the, this brine, you're thinking about how do we manage that. You mentioned only a few of the papers dealt with sort of the brine management, like what do you do with this waste? And we had a, a specific question about that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about sort of these interactions between, okay, like we have this system, we can optimize it for energy or for power or for cost. Um, but there may be some of these more, whether it's life cycle or the brine management, like we have all this salt now, uh, what do we do with it? Um, can you talk about some of those effects in terms of, hey, we might solve this problem for making the water at an economical price point, but have we created, how do you think about whether they're intended or unintended consequences of some of these byproducts uh, on some other, uh, you know, dimension that we is not directly the the water recovery yeah so i think to clarify like from the from the beginning when we started looking at desalination we knew that the brine would be an issue right we, we knew there wasn't anywhere to put it <laughs> the companies told us that the communities told us that they would just dump it on the ground um, part of the issue is that we don't have good quantification of the effect of doing that particularly for these really small systems we have a lot of good data in the desalination community around what happens when you put, dispose of brine impro improperly back into the sea, how that might affect marine life, for example. That, the information around that is starting to grow. But what really happens when you dump a little bit of brine right outside your building in a rural community? Is that an issue or not? And so part of this is that when the conversation first started, the government wasn't regulating it in India. Um, it was a small enough volume and the person that owned the land didn't seem to care and whatever. And so part of it was through conversations and discussing it, um, that was sort of the direction that we went, knowing that eventually we would need to think more about that as an issue. Um, and then I think for me, once I started realizing that this brine management is an issue in desalination, but it's also an issue for industry, uh, chromium plating is a big one in India, textile industry, where they also have these really saline brines where, where that's not either an option or acceptable and where the federal government is starting to regulate it, then it started to drive that conversation more about how do we actually involve that in the model um, and how do we start bringing that in to the cost estimate, estimation. I think for me, when you, the question is how far out you go. So for example, do you also look at the energy embedded in the creation of the solar panel? Etc. That to me is when it gets with outside the scope a little bit of my expertise in my area and when I try to partner with others to look at those effects versus when it's still in this water space, what happens to the clean water, where does it come from and what happens to the brine, all, all are directly inputs and outputs of that desalination system that that do need to be considered and should be considered holistically. So I, I would actually argue that every single one of those desalination papers, because they were pilots, not lab studies, should have said what they did with the brine and what it cost them. Um, so I think there are some boundaries that, that we as a community need to define, like this should be part of your analysis and we should be doing it in the same way. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't know if that... <laughs> no, that's a great. Uh, there's a lot of people on uh, the call right now, I think they're interested in your work because they are working practitioners Mm -hmm. in desalination or actually getting or in water treatment we're getting a lot of questions um when we don't have a lot of time left uh but getting a lot of questions around perhaps different technologies um okay. other than desalination working in conjunction with reverse osmosis or uh you know some of these other ones that are you know you, if you read the desalination journal you know there's lots of models and technologies that are being developed all the time and i think one of the things that I would like to ask you about in terms of your project trajectory is given that we're looking at these pilots, these are projects with practitioner partners, right? Industry partners. Mm -hmm. um, and we have these different technologies that may or may not be commercial, you know, commercializable, uh, commercializable, I don't know, cannot be commercialized uh, easily depending on different factors. Um, yeah. I, I, what I'm hearing and in, in what you're saying, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about is, is there a role for the academic? So you were like developing new technologies, right? We're looking at different ways of putting these systems together. What are things we can do with geometry, et cetera. 
but you were talking about perhaps there's a lack of information and data for systems in emerging markets, right? So when we're thinking about the development context, it sounds like, okay, well, if we're doing a really large desalination plant in San Diego and we're thinking about what is the effect when we put it into the ocean, okay, we have all these studies that have looked into that. But if I'm like, what is the, can I predict the impact of putting a little bit of salt in a lot of decentralized places across a larger area, that might be a problem or might not be a problem. I don't know. And I think that that is a problem across lots of sectors, not just water, is this existing data empirical models, which is a lot of our engineering knowledge. Mm -hmm. We don't, we haven't done for these cases where the, the artifact or the project or the system is in a very different context, right? And so um, I was wondering if you, how, how do you approach like trying to answer that question, whether it's the Brine one in India or any of the number you, you've showed a lot of charts of things happening in India but I assume that that data was either is, doesn't exist for everything, right? Like maybe it exists for groundwater, but there's lots of things that you may want to know, mm -hmm. but don't, doesn't exist, right? The, the data doesn't exist. So I was wondering how you approach that and thinking about developing the context of the system and developing that system model um, and, and some of the challenges that you've run into doing that. And then I think we can, we can end it there. Okay. So I would say that first and foremost that these stakeholders even if they don't become a partner so there is a difference between a partner and a stakeholder in my mind but many of the people and stakeholders that we interviewed um, and practitioners that are installing desalination systems first of all sometimes but often don't know necessarily why they chose for example reverse osmosis it was recommended to them and we chose it At, because sometimes these various implementing organizations maybe don't have that full engineering background, they don't realize how valuable the data you ha they have is. So that for me, there is a lot of stuff where I was like, you have a logbook of pressure over the last year? You have a logbook of water consumption from your plant over the, why isn't this published? <laughs> like I, that's hard data to get. And so for me personally in my lab, it's, it's telling these stakeholders I find if they're willing to share that so that I can collect that data on my own and find ways to publish it. Um, I also think that, I guess for anyone on this call, recognizing that if you have a water treatment system, a desalination system that is running in a community for more than a few months and you have data on how that's performing, like get it out. Like we need to find a way as a community <laughs> to, to get that out there, even if you're not the one that knows what to do with that data. Um, because we, it's very hard on the academic side to get that. Running a pilot from the US and India is hard. Like. <laughs> taken a lot of like two night planning trips to India, right? So how do you, how do you collect that information um, when so many, I think it exists and it's an issue of getting it to you. So for me personally, that's been talking to the right people, making sure people understand that that value, that data is valuable to me and why, and if they're willing to share that and acknowledging their work, but that I think, I think that's a big piece of it. Part of those graphs is that those are all, you know, those are all pilots run by academics. And we know there's desalination systems all around the world, and I have no idea how they're working, other than the ones I've seen in person, right? Um, so I, I guess that's, I, I would say, is we need to find a way to collect that data beyond me just yeah. asking questions. Wow, that's great. Thank you. So I, I just want to acknowledge, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it over to you, Yana. So I just want to thank you again, Natasha. Uh, just yeah. always inspiring to hear what you're doing. Uh, get me to get back in there to try and try and catch up. Uh, to, to do something uh, equally as good. Uh, so great to hear the, the stuff that, that you're doing. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. I want to also address that your work has like uh, perhaps uh, generated the most questions we've ever had. So I was oh, unable to get, her bad. Get, to, get to everyone. No, these really great questions, I think really sparking a dialogue. And I think that's great. And I think what I want to say to the people who have posted questions that we have not been able to address we are going to have those to Natasha, so just please check back when we uh, post the recorded video. We're going to have those responses. I'd also encourage you to reach out to Natasha. Some of the people had specific things. If you're an NGO or, or somebody else that, you know, perhaps has an interesting connection or would like to just discuss with her, I know that uh, Dr. Wright has, you know, her, her contact information is available um, and, and you guys should reach out, um, but she will be, try will be answering all of the questions in the Q&A. 
Uh, and I also want to address there was a question about sort of how do we do these types of projects in COVID uh, conditions, like when you can't travel to India, uh, you can't travel at all. Uh, you know. Can I actually say one thing yeah, on that? Yeah, I was gonna. I was just gonna. Yeah. Say we're developing answers so, to that. Go ahead. Yeah, so we're developing answers to that, and as a result, I actually have a really cool like six continent wide study that that we're gonna do for the dialysis project where we're, look, we're working, trying to find students across the six continents that we can train in some of the methods we use to then implement. Um, as a sideline, I might send you, Yana, the list of, there's a few specific countries actually, that particularly if you're further from those countries, but in general, if you know anything about dialysis in your country that you're calling in from, please actually reach out because we're like in the next six months, effectively what we're trying to do, we can't travel. and the benefit of that is that we're training local people to do what we probably should have been doing forever um, and having them running a lot of these studies. So um, yeah, that's, that's my plug for that is that we've, we've essentially had to transition from doing all the work ourselves or a lot of the work ourselves in, the, in that part of the design ethnography and, and really handing it over to people in, in other countries. I think that's a yeah. excellent segue and thank you for that practical example because um, this is where the Engineering for Change has been working actively over the last 10 years. We're actually celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year to, to build this community, this connective tissue amongst all of the uh, practitioners and researchers that are doing this work. And I, I want to give a plug for next month's presenter, specifically with that idea in mind, Natasha. Um, because next month we are going to be focusing on uh, biomedical engineering and building biomedical engineering capacity. Um, our presenter will be Carmelo de Maria, who is an assistant professor of bioengineering at the Department of Ingeniería del Informazione, as my best Italian accent I could do, at the University of Pisa. Um, and in particular, he is, going, he is also a member of the African Biomedical Engineering Consortium Secretariat and has led a lot of the effort related to a platform, a digital platform that he'll be sharing um, on, on the uh, presentation called Ubora, which brings uh, and biomedical engineering students, professors from around the world together. So this call to action, Natasha, and this request might be excellent for that subsequent seminar. And of course, we will be happy to share that through our community of engineers and researchers and students as part of the work that we do in, in developing our fellowships. So very exciting. And this is a very actionable seminar, if I've ever been on it. Yes, as Dr. <laughs> Brenneman mentioned, we are going to be sharing um, those questions with Natasha and uh, sharing uh, the responses via our platform. If you didn't catch her email, you can also email us webinars at engineeringforchange.org, research at engineeringforchange.org, it will all come to us. With that, I know we are over time. I'd like to thank you all for giving us an extra two minutes. I'd like to wish you all a good day, good evening, good morning, depending where you are from. Uh, please stay tuned for the recording and uh, join us as E4C members to get uh, the invitations for future seminars directly in your inbox, as well as the notification of the recording. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you on the next E4C seminar. Have a good day. Bye everyone.